Good morning. I love this Psalm 33. The earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. The earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. It's full from creation, but it's particularly full with the presence of human beings who can know, explore, study, get familiar with the richness, the goodness of the Lord, who can make apples and wheat grains into apple pie. The earth is full of the goodness of the Lord who can take some stuff from the earth and make that truck that's on the road over there and make it travel. Who can organize the water and deal with flooding and draining and disposal. And who can make this bus And who can organize a bus company so that many people have transport. And who can organize airplanes and birthday parties and produce electricity and have light at night time. The earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. And a basketball game Imagine all the games in the world and how that fills up the earth and all the novels and all the poetry and all the flowers that blossom and bloom and bear fruit and regenerate and there are new flowers next year. And I'm not sure if it's still here. There was an uh, aloe vera plant here this thing is growing so abundantly. There it is. And the aloe vera plant. It's hiding in here. A little bit. Tiny bit withered looking, but it's working. It's still there. The aloe vera is very tough. Do you see the aloe vera? Oh, four or five of them, actually. And all the goodness that's in aloe vera. Vera. and all the goodness that's in the depths of the sea and in the depths of the earth the minerals and all the birds in the air the fish and the animals and the sounds of the birds, like these doves cooing. The earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. And then it's, the fullness is really plenitude because it's there because of the goodness of the Lord. The goodness put it there. Goodness, personal goodness put it there. The earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. sleeping here. I won't speak too loudly. There's a tent here.
and even silence in the valley, in the mountains, is something really wholesome and good. And then there are other two notes struck in the readings that are very strong, very piercing for our worldly wisdom. All the camps are gone, the tents are gone, camp is still here at campground, <laughs> but the tents are gone. There's some over there, at least one I see. And it says, for the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom. And the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. That's something to chew on. Those are the closing verses of the text from Corinthians today. I'm going to speak about this more at Mass this evening. About this reading. It's very much centered on one of the core, or the core climactic move of God in our world. And it's about the cross and the place of the cross. Maybe that's something also that those who are not Christian would be curious about to understand why, how come, how crazy that the cross is a defining, the defining symbol of Christianity. If you go to the presentation of the religions around the world, they'll have the lunar crescent, and they'll have maybe the menorah, or the Star of David, and they'll have uh, different symbols for others, but the cross is the one for us. And that cross without Good Friday is, is meaningless. It's not, uh, it, it could have some symbolic value. We use the word crossroads, but it's more than a crossroads. Maybe it's the ultimate crossroads of the human divine encounter. And then there's a second part, a second wing to that bird is the resurrection. A bird can fly on one wing. So it's the cross and the light of the resurrection. Maybe the, the biggest statement about the cross for the Christians is the experience that's expressed in John's Gospel. God loved the world so much he gave his only son. And that again is a huge mystery that needs a lot of pondering, contemplation, reflection. So this is the very big theme that Paul speaks into today in the Corinthians letter. And does require a lot, a lot. It requires a big heart, it requires patience. It requires understanding perspective. Hey, look at these stones up here. This is a good place to use this image. Look at these stones up here. You have those caves in this little spot up here. There to the right, you have that darker spot there. That's a big cave. And actually to the center, you see another cave opening. And it's actually one cave. It's just like a corridor inside the mountain. And then if you keep coming back here to the left and you go up and you see those big rocks that are up there, 
they're pretty heavy and pretty big. Now imagine if you took away the mountain that's below them, but you still wanted to keep those rocks in that position. The strength it would take to do that, the power, the energy, the Tarzan. So once I imagined a metal frame around them and supply electricity and create a magnetic field and keep the rocks up there, how much electricity would it take to keep those rocks up there without the mountain? And that's a little bit the challenge analogy of quite a few points of our faith, definitely as Christians, how to sustain the thinking about a lot of different things. So there's a lot presupposed that's underneath that's sustaining them. Because actually they sustain easily for a Christian, but that's because there's a very big base of other points made and accepted that holds up those points that seem to counter our reason. Maybe I've gotten into a conversation that's too much for at least 10 or 15 minutes at sunrise, straw and chat. We should do that another time. But it's an approach I took in Germany in the city of Dresden at a big national event. What year would have been mid 90s probably. And we had our booth there like so many other different Christian organizations at this big fair, if you will, called Katholikentag. And the title that we chose for ours was Without the mountain, you can't have a mountaintop. It was also connected to a story as a student, and that was mountain climbing. How this idea came to, to form itself back in northern Spain when we were on vacations after our junior year in, in Salamanca. And there's a story with the rock that was up on the mountaintop we started to move kind of a very irresponsible action but in a foolish moment that wasn't wise i think we're not going to get all this ground covered but it's it's very uh, interesting how we can establish that christ crucified is so central so such a summary of the whole of salvation's path the redemption of suffering not the elimination of suffering the redemption of suffering and interestingly when jesus comes back after the resurrection he still has his wounds so there also the suffering has not been eliminated from the map completely the memory of that is still there and that is redemptive put your finger in my the wounds of my hand put your hand into the wound on my side and believe so paul cuts into this topic uh, in our reading today and yeah it would be good to have half a day to talk about it <laughs> But for the person who is sick in bed, very sick, maybe dying, or the person that's going through terrible grief after a terrible tragedy, to clutch the cross, to hold the cross, to squeeze it tight to your chest, to kiss the cross, becomes extraordinarily powerful, consoling, carries us through overcomes revenge, 
enables pardon. Rescues people from total collapse. Takes us up like on eagle wings. Absolutely amazing. And then we have the foolish and the wise virgins with their oil lamps in the gospel. And again, this would take more time. I heard a very interesting <clears throat> explanation that was clear on this last night from our friend in Australia, the gospel exegesis, and brought it to a very clear point that the friends of the bridegroom, these uh, virgins who were holding the lamps, so that when they would come at an unpredictable time, if that's the way wedding parties are here in the Middle East, and especially in those times, then they needed to have light, and that time there wasn't electricity. And there weren't batteries, and there was oil, and it could last two more hours before they come because they're delayed someplace else in their party. <coughs> As they process from the girl's house to the groom's house, and needing to be prepared to honor the groom who arrives, not to disappoint them and have them arrive in darkness at his house. So, and that uh, commitment of love that provides for the happy celebration of the greatest moment in life is, uh, hey, good morning, Mike Bokertov. Uh, it's the, the reason some people, I actually heard another comment from another priest. Uh, well, the other guy in Australia is not a priest, I don't think, but the guy, uh, one a priest today in the commentary uh, holds it against people god bless you see you later alligators come on here let's say goodbye there we go god bless you a lot to think about and chew upon and be enriched and prayer for peace there we can see all the mountains of lebanon pray for all the people in lebanon we can't see very far into syria and at this point here with these trees we can't see to jordan but everybody is praying for peace here. That prayers are not wasted, people. Prayers are never wasted. So keep up the prayer. And we hope and hope and hope. And now the sun is going to come out for Instagram. As this jet ski pierces the silence of the lake this morning. God bless you.